So this is a very uh, difficult task because it is quite difficult to actually <laughs> Uh, list Fred's achievements in a few slides or a, or a few ten slides. Um, he's officially astronomy in charge of the Anglo-Australian Observatory, which is now the uh, Australian Astronomical Observatory at Takuna Barra Brown Signing Springs since 95. He was born in Yorkshire, uh, went to university in Scotland um, and moved to Australia in the early 1980s. Uh, he did his PhD in the University of Edinburgh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, on multi-object astronomical spectroscopy with optical fibres. And uh, indeed, he's actually helped to pioneer the use of fibre optics in astronomy at the start of a new era of statistical studies and astrophysics. He's also contributed to several major surveys uh, of motions of stars and galaxies, for example, the 60F and the RAID survey. And perhaps what we know him best from is his public outreach and this is a very amusing uh, quote from his bio. A small component of Fred's job that spills over into a large component of his private life is communicating astronomy to the public. That's very well said. <laughs> um, as you know, he's, uh, he's had several regular spots on ABC radio and he's a frequent guest on television, uh, Catalyst, The Project, and I believe I actually saw you on uh, ABC 24, was it last month or something, after the media strike in Russia? <laughs> so, um, and he writes regularly for several publications, Australian Geographic, Sky and Space, Sky and Telescope, and of course he's written a number of books, um, uh, for example, Stargazer, The Life and Times of the Telescope, and Why is Uranus Upside Down? And other questions about the universe. Um, in 2006, he joined forces with Maniog to create illuminating tours to take people to exotic destinations, including uh, exclusive visits to observatories and institutes all around the world. Sounds very nice. Uh, but he's a man of many talents. <laughs> because to pay for his uni fees, Fred actually used to play guitar in folk clubs. And he actually uses this in his daily work with science outreach. He has a CD out, An Alien Like You. That's an, I really would like to hear that. He hasn't got his guitar here. Uh, oh, has he? I'm not sure. <laughs> so he wrote the, the text for Star Chant, uh, a choral symphony by the Australian composer Ross Edwards. And of course, there are the awards, and some only, because we've got only a few here, uh, the David Allen Prize uh, for the, uh, of the Astronomical Society of Australia, the Australian Government Eureka Prize in 2006, and in 2010, he was awarded the Member of the Order of Australia. And to top it all off, yes, he has an asteroid. <laughs> Fred, has, there's even an asteroid named after him, 5691 Fred Watson. Um, but says that if it hits the Earth, it won't be his fault, <laughs> which, uh, well, let's see, Fred. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, please welcome <laughs> Professor Fred Watson. Well, that was the best introduction I've ever had. Thank you very much for that. I found out things about myself that I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I want to see, but that's probably a uh, <laughs> minor detail. Oh, it's my machine's gone to sleep, that's all. Okay, let's uh, try and stoke it up. That looks kind of good. Yes, that looks vaguely acceptable. Let me see whether it's really acceptable by bringing up that. Yes. So, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ahmed, and thank you, everybody. Uh, for such a warm welcome to Melbourne, it's a delight to be here. Um, this is, uh, I can't remember where we are on the tour, but this is um, one of the, the last venues in this uh, uh, tour to promote uh, this new book, Star Craving Mad, uh, Tales from a Travelling Astronomer, which uh, should uh, appear somewhere on the screen. Uh, there you go. Uh, now, I do have a, I think I've got a slight problem with, uh, there might be just a slight problem with, aspect ratio there, but if there is, we'll just put up with it. No, it's okay, that's fine, that's all right. Um, and that's, um, that's me, that's uh, the organisation that still pays my salary. After all these years, they haven't found out that I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but David Malin uh, used to tell me that he had no idea what he was doing either. The, and it didn't stop him becoming the world's most famous astronomical photographer. So uh, let me bring up uh, the reason, the kind of the reason why I'm here is to tell you about this new book, which uh, came out at the end of January. And uh, I'd love to be able to take credit for the title, but I can't. It was Marnie who thought of the title. So, uh, <laughs> um, but it, uh, it's a, a book that's really aimed at 
uh, trying to explain how it is that we know what we know about the universe. Because it's all very well talking about stars and galaxies and all the rest of it. But it's nice to be able to find out how it is that we know all these things about the universe. And so it's, um, it's a rather... Uh, I suppose it's a romp through astronomical history, you might put it that way, as well as a, an account of, of what we're learning in modern science. And in particular, I've tried to highlight uh, what's going on in, us, in uh, science in uh, Australia, because Australia consistently punches above its weight in the world of astronomy, certainly, and I think in science generally. And it's not only institutions like this august institution that do that. There are places all over the country that, uh, that actually do an extraordinary job in pushing back the frontiers of knowledge and moreover in spreading the word, in getting uh, news out about, uh, about the kind of great things that have happened. So that's what the, the book's about. Actually, to be honest, that, all that is se secondary. The main uh, reason for writing the book was to entertain you, the reader. <laughs> you see, it's all about trying to engage people. But as you can see, there's, um, there's a, a, a subplot as well, which is, uh, which is travel. And as, um, as Hamid just mentioned, one of the things that I've spent quite a bit of time doing over the past six, seven years is uh, taking groups of interested Australians to places in the world where either big discoveries excuse me, my mint's just cracked, either big discoveries have been made, or uh, where special things can be seen, such as the eclipse of, uh, of 2012 last year on November the 14th. So uh, it's a travelogue as well as, uh, as well as other things too. Just a, 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 a kind of housekeeping note here. Um, we, we do have books with us, you can see some there, but uh, Marnie apologises that the box of books that we were expecting to be delivered from the uh, publishers so that we'd have lots of books uh, available for you here hasn't yet arrived. We think it'll come tomorrow morning. So if we get to the end of the night and there are more people wanting books than we have books here, it's very easy for us to take your details and Marnie's very efficient at getting things out of the door as soon as we get back to Sydney, probably before, actually. So um, please don't, uh, don't be disappointed if, uh, if, if you get to the end of the queue and that, there's, um, that there aren't enough books. And I can deface them with a signature or anything else you want in them uh, quite as easily uh, when, when we're back at home as, as I can here. So uh, this book uh, is actually uh, the third one that, uh, that I've written for Alan and Unwin, who... Uh, as a company, uh, a delight to work with. Um, in fact, uh, the publisher I worked with on this book, Fung Ling Kong, is based here in Melbourne. So we haven't met yet, in fact. We've, uh, we've spoken uh, over the email, but not in person. Uh, they are great uh, at uh, publishing books of an unusual nature, um, ranging across the whole gamut of, of literature and non-fiction, and fiction too, of course, um, they, uh, they are great at uh, thinking of new ways of presenting books, but they always seem to be um, reluctant to volunteer to put pictures in books. And that's a reason, uh, the reason for that is something I've not yet understood. I suspect it's because pictures are expensive. So imagine my delight when, uh, when this book was coming through, when I had an email uh, from Fung Ling saying, you can have eight pages of colour in this book. And I thought, wow, eight pages of colour pictures, I can put everything in it. So um, I kind of started a list, and then it got rather big, so I started crossing ones off the list. And when it got down to 137 pictures, I thought, this is not really going to work. Uh, so uh, there is a limited selection of pictures in this book covering eight pages. Uh, and what I'd like to do is just take uh, two or three of those tonight to give you some idea of the, the, the background behind the book, the things that the book is about. Uh, in other words, take you a little bit behind the scenes. I'll take you behind the scenes on this cover picture straight away because uh, this must not go beyond these four walls, but I was not looking at the stars when that picture was taken. However, what you're thinking of was he's looking in somebody's bedroom window. I wasn't doing that either. I was actually watching mountaineers on a glacier in Switzerland when that picture was taken, uh, and <laughs> they, they uh, finally managed to put it on the, on the cover of the book, which is delightful. So let me start with actually the last picture that's in the book, um, which is this one. And this is uh, something that uh, 
has turned out to be uh, very close to my heart. Uh, it's the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. Um, and this image was actually taken not in the Antarctic, because you don't see the Northern Lights in the Antarctic, you see the Southern Lights, the Aurora Australis. This was taken in far northern Norway at a place called Lingenfjord. Um, I first saw the aurora from Scotland when I was at university about 150 years ago uh, and was enchanted with it. And in fact, we used to see it quite commonly in Scotland. Uh, you seem to see it more when you've been in the pub and, uh, you know, been having a good time. Um, but uh, it's certainly visible from Scotland. But it is nothing like the view that you would get uh, from the Arctic or that you do get from the Arctic. And this picture taken by Anne Spencer, who was on a tour of ours last year, um, uh, shows very clearly something called an auroral corona, which is a sort of burst of light from directly above your head. It looks for all the world like a butterfly. Uh, but actually what's happening is you're looking up. Um, uh, uh, it's a sort of um, optical illusion. You're looking up a whole ar array of parallel lines of light coming down towards the Earth's surface. And of course... Just like railway lines seem to converge as you see them going off into the distance, these things converge too because they're, they're getting further away. I'll say a bit more about the aurora in a minute, but let me show you where that picture was taken. And it was uh, from, from here. This is a place called Lingenfjord, which is uh, in far northern Norway. It's delightful during the day. It's delightful at night too. Um, the aurora is something that has, I guess, puzzled people uh, for... For thousands of years, the Sami people of far northern Norway uh, used to talk about the spirits of the departed and how it's very bad to look at the aurora. Uh, but we now know that this sort of glittering and really very, um, um, very flexible array of lights in the sky are caused by subatomic particles which uh, emit, are emitted by the sun uh, and they are basically guided down the magnetic field lines of the Earth near the Earth's north and south pole um, and energize the atmosphere. What, the, the green light that you can see actually comes from oxygen. Uh, in past times, people really didn't know what they were looking at and this picture is a woodcut that was made in 1570 and it's lovely the way the artist has depicted the aurora as candles the clouds. And when you see a bright aurora, that's what you're reminded of, the flickering effect. These images, uh, which weren't made by any of our party, uh, they're made by a, a Norwegian photographer by the name of Ole Salmonson, very, very expert photographer. And they're time-lapse images. So what he does is he takes a, an exposure with his camera of perhaps one, two, up to four or five seconds and then another one and stitches them together to make a movie which shows the way the aurora borealis appears to move and that movement comes from the, just the variation in, the, in the, the way the energetic particles from the sun seem to interact with the atmosphere. There was a man uh, at the turn of the 20th century who kind of worked out what was going on. His name was Christian Birkeland. He's a, a, he was Norwegian. Uh, he had a very interesting life and he was the person who suggested that the aurora borealis had something to do with the sun. Uh, sadly, he was uh, laughed out of court by uh, other scientists, in particular the British, who thought that they had responsibility for everything that came from the sun. After all, gravity is a British invention. Sir Isaac Newton, uh, and this was before Einstein and general relativity. Uh, infrared light, a British invention, William Herschel. Light, a British invention, a invention James Clark <laughs> Maxwell. Uh, so particles from the sun invented by a Norwegian. Oh, dear me, no. So it was um, very much... Uh, uh, you know, frowned upon by the Brits. And actually that, in, in the end, sent Birkeland mad because he, he basically overdosed on sleeping tablets uh, to get through uh, the feeling of persecution by the British. He died during the First World War. And under sad circumstances, he was on his way from Egypt, uh, from Cairo to Oslo, but he went via Tokyo to avoid the British. And he died in Tokyo. It's a very sad story. Um, anyway, uh, to cut <laughs> what really is a long story short... Um, the, the bottom line in all this is that uh, it's the sun that generates the energy that causes the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. Of course, they're symmetrical uh, about the, uh, with the northern and southern poles having very similar auroral activity. But it's uh, magnetic uh, storms, essentially, uh, in, the, in the sun's surface, which we now know are much more important than we ever thought they were, 
Uh, it's those magnetic effects that generate the particles of plasma, the, char the ionized gas, the charged particles uh, that come uh, to us from the sun and that essentially uh, then react with the magnetic field of the Earth to cause the aurora. This is just a little snippet of footage from a spacecraft called the Solar Dynamics uh, Observatory, which is one of a whole flotilla of spacecraft observing the sun. And uh, you can see that lots of things are happening there. Uh, and in particular, this region is where we would find sunspots, the things that historically have been noted on the sun as, as being symptomatic of activity. But we now know that they are absolutely riddled with intense magnetic fields. You get a suggestion there of, of gas being uh, moved along magnetic fields, but every so often those magnetic fields break, and what you get is what you see there, uh, um, a, a sort of flinging into space of a cloud of plasma. This happens... More when the sun is at what we call the peak of its activity. The sun has an 11-year cycle, uh, which you can easily detect by counting sunspots. Uh, that's how it was first discovered back in the uh, 19th century. This 11-year cycle uh, of a maximum number of sunspots falling to a minimum and then going up again 11 years later. And the solar flares and other uh, events, uh, things called... Uh, um, chromospheric eruptions, they are uh, all at a peak during maximum of the sun's activity. And the sun's current activity maximum is now, essentially, 2012, 2013, which is why we took two tours up to the aurora, up to the Arctic last year, and another one this year. Uh, just to cheer you up, by the way, that's the size of the Earth on the same scale as this image. That's the edge of the sun's disk, of course. The sun is about 100 times the diameter of the Earth. But, of course, all this is happening 150 million kilometers away. So you don't have to panic too much about, uh, uh, about clouds of gas like that. But isn't it? It's spectacular stuff, isn't it? It's amazing what we're seeing today. So let me just take you uh, to one particular day during our tour of the Arctic uh, at the beginning of this year. This picture was taken on the 13th of January 2013. When we were on our way north from Narvik in northwestern Norway up to Tromsø, which is further north still, this is the main highway. It's the kind of Hume Highway of, uh, of uh, Norway. It's the E6 runs all the way up the west coast. It's a super highway because uh, there's lots of traffic on it, as you can see. Uh, and uh, we were, this picture and the next couple were taken from the front window of a coach. Uh, this picture was taken roughly at noon when you might expect it would be daylight and the sun would be out. But of course, uh, in, in early January, uh, in uh, a region north of the Arctic Circle, the sun actually doesn't rise. And in fact, the sun was not coming up above the horizon. It did a few days later. It, they had the first sunrise in Tromsø, and everybody was very happy about that. So were we, because it was nice to see the sun again. But you can see uh, the kind of landscape it is. The street lights are all still on, because it's, it, it's the Arctic night. It's not dark. It's a, it's a twilight effect, a twilight phenomenon. And in fact, twilight lasts for hours and hours uh, in these latitudes. So uh, very, very uh, emotive very major road. Um, actually, our, our um, trip this year wasn't particularly cold. This was uh, later on, further on the same road. Uh, minus three is, is absolutely boiling for an Arctic uh, winter's day. Uh, we expected much colder, but that might be something to do with climate change. And every so often, your trip is interrupted when, uh, when reindeer decide they need to cross the road. Uh, so um, we had to stop from time to time. We also stopped this is real travelogue stuff, isn't it? We also stopped at the, uh, at the Polar Zoo, which is about 100, 100 kilometers north of Narvik, I think. We stopped there and saw some of the animals there. And uh, in, the one that stole everybody's heart was this Arctic fox cub, which everybody wanted to take home. It was just such a delightful little creature. Uh, they're very sweet animals. If ever you come across one, you know, you should adopt it because uh, there probably aren't too many in Melbourne, uh, although I'm sure there are in the zoo. So, uh, this day was a rather momentous day, uh, not just because we were travelling up uh, the western coastline of Norway, but because on the other side of the world, uh, something quite different was happening, and it was this. Um, the 13th of January, uh, when I got up uh, and started reading email, uh, the first thing I got was this picture. And this is taken from the walkway 
of our big telescope, the Anglo-Australian telescope, at Coonabarabran in northwestern New South Wales, operated by the, the organisation I work for. Uh, that uh, smoke is coming from the National Park, the Warren Bungle National Park next door, and <coughs> uh, the, the email that accompanied it said, we are about to evacuate the observatory. Uh, which was not good news. In fact, that whole day was spent on either on email or on the phone because I have friends and family who, whose houses were affected uh, and it was actually a little bit stressful. Let me take you back to what it normally looks like. This is the uh, Siding Spring Observatory uh, in, uh, in uh, earlier times, uh, covered, of course, in trees. It's, uh, Siding Spring is a peak in uh, a range of mountains called the Warren Bungles. And Warren Bungle is a Gamilaray word, meaning crooked mountains. And as you can see behind me, that's what they are. It's a stunningly beautiful place. The, uh, the domes uh, belong to Siding Spring Observatory, which is operated by a whole range of institutions. We, uh, the Australian Astronomical Observatory, operate the biggest telescope there, which is that big dome on the left, the dome of the Anglo-Australian Telescope, uh, and a smaller dome in front of it to the United Kingdom Schmidt Telescope. Um, I often tell people that I've, uh, my office is in that uh, AAT dome, and I've been working in there for so many years that I've started to look like it. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm sure that could be other things besides just uh, familiarity. Uh, very briefly, let me, because I, I want to explain why this is such a big deal, uh, the telescopes at this observatory have contributed in a major way to our understanding of the universe. In fact, in Star Craving Mad, there's a whole chapter on them. Uh, and even just one of them, here, which uh, is called the United Kingdom Schmidt Telescope because it was originally built by the UK, uh, has contributed um, science of a, a, an exceptional kind. Uh, this is one example. Even the smallest telescope has made groundbreaking maps of the universe. This is something called the 60F Galaxy Survey. And it, uh, each one of those dots is a galaxy. Uh, so this is a map of the positions in space of actually 136,000 galaxies. And we did that during the period 2001 to 2005. Uh, since then, we've been working on something that you've heard about already called RAVE, which is a, another major project in terms of understanding our locality in the universe. Uh, the, the, the dark line across the middle isn't a gap in the universe. It's the region where we can't see because of the Milky Way, the disk of our own galaxy, which I'll say a little bit more about in a moment. But I just wanted to um, explain to you why it's such a big deal that a few odd buildings, and they are strange-looking buildings, on top of a mountain in northwestern New South Wales should raise such a level of anxiety among uh, circles ranging from uh, the humblest inhabitant of Coonabarabran to the Prime Minister uh, when it is threatened by fire. So uh, later in the same day, that picture I just showed you with the uh, telescope domes a minute ago, uh, it looked like that. And that uh, is the Schmidt telescope, the one I've just mentioned. But as you can see, the fire basically came up over the mountaintop. Uh, it was a monumental fire. In the end, it burned out 55,000 hectares. Uh, you here in Victoria are very familiar with the effects of bushfires and the tragedies that, are accompanying, uh, that they are accompanied by. We were very fortunate, actually, in the bushfire, uh, this one. Even though it burned a big area, um, it destroyed only 53 homes. It's very sad for the people who lived there, and some of my friends and colleagues lived in some of those homes. Um, but um, no life was lost, and in fact, there were no injuries either. This picture found its way onto the front page of the, the Herald and probably the Age as well. That's the Anglo-Australian Telescope Dome just before the fire front came through. And perhaps the most dramatic one of all, taken by a former neighbour of mine in, from Coonabarabran, which is 20 kilometres away from the mountaintop, um, showing you just what a fearsome fire this is. It looks more like a volcano going off. Well, the end result of all this was far, far better than we could have hoped because one building was destroyed, but it was the only building uh, that we could have said at the beginning, if anything had to go, it could be this one. <laughs> um, it wasn't a telescope. It's actually something very close to the hearts of some people in this room, I know, uh, and, and certainly mine, because I've spent so many, many, many nights, months and months of nights, 
This is the, the lodge, the motel that astronomers stay in when they're observing on the telescopes. And it's a place where many of us in the world of astronomy have crashed out at the end of a hard night's observing as the sun's coming up. All you want to do is go to bed. Uh, this uh, is room six where I used to stay. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's all gone, uh, which, is, which is, as I said, very sad. But uh, honestly, it's far better that the lodge should burn down than any of the telescopes because they are such a big investment in infrastructure and so important in what they've achieved in astronomy. Uh, the irony of all this was, as I said, I was on tour. I was, uh, spent the whole day panicking about what was going on in Kuna Barabran, uh, but the tour that we were on uh, in, up there in the Arctic uh, was called Fire in the Sky, uh, which um, people said to me afterwards, why didn't you keep it there? You know, keep it in the sky. Don't worry about bringing it down to earth. So we had uh, really rather an interesting time. However, uh, after a week, we knew that the fire had basically burned out. Uh, um, uh, it, it, it threatened uh, the town of Kuna Barabran for a whole week because it kept, you know, moving around the town as the wind changed. But uh, at the end of that time, uh, there was another week uh, of really quite mild weather, followed by some very heavy rain. And that is why, when you visit the observatory now, it's only seven weeks after the fire, or at least when this picture was taken, it was, uh, nature has just taken off. Uh, as you can see, the trees are absolutely bursting with, uh, with leaves. The grass is growing. That was taken about a week ago. So, in the end, uh, I suppose a good news story. And, of course, the observatory uh, will recover. And maybe one day we might even get a new lodge. People are already saying, can we have a swimming pool, please? But, you know, don't think the ANU will run to that. Let me take you... You all okay? Everybody uh, happy and not... Going? You can, I can put the lights down. You can go to sleep if you like. It's, I, I usually do have the lights quite low just so people can go to sleep with impunity. Um, let me take you to another picture, uh, which is a room a bit like this one, actually, only, only rather bigger. This also is in, uh, in Star Craving Mad. And you can see uh, that what's happening there is a vote is being taken. And just to tell you what this is all about, this picture shows the moment in which... Pluto stopped being a planet. <laughs> Can I ask actually among my colleagues here, were any of you there? I know Nick was. Yeah, you were there, Nick. Tell me, you weren't there. No, okay. So Nick Lom, who's in the audience, is somewhere in this picture. He's pointing. There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there's another one coming up in a moment. So it, this was actually a really remarkable occasion uh, because this was... Uh, an event in which for the very first time in history the word planet was being defined. <laughs> and you might think, you know, good God, astronomers have been using telescopes for 400 years and they don't know what a planet is. Because what, before this vote was taken, we didn't. There were so many conflicting um, ideas and definitions that really nobody knew what a planet was. So this uh, really settled the issue. And it's a story, though, that goes back uh, rather a long time. Uh, it goes back to 1930, which is the year in which the uh, former planet Pluto <laughs> was discovered, uh, towards the end of, uh, towards the end of uh, 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 February, actually, when, uh, when it was found by a man called Clyde Tombow who was looking for a planet, more or less, where Pluto was found. And that was because people thought there were uh, irregularities in the orbits of Neptune and Ur Uranus, the outer two gas giant planets, which were being caused by a planet beyond them whose gravity was pulling them slightly out of their orbits, as, as, as expected. And so uh, people were looking for a ninth planet, and when it was found, there was great rejoicing because people thought this was an object of some considerable size that was having a gravitational influence on the outer planets of the solar system. So that was in Arizona in 1930. Now, the first slide I'd like to show you, though, is this one, which is, you probably can guess, this is not Arizona. Uh, this is actually Oxford. And the reason why the story moves to Oxford is because a young woman whose picture is here, who was 11 years old at the time, and whose name was Venetia Burney, uh, she uh, actually named Pluto. Uh, she was a rather bright young woman, uh, interested in astronomy, interested in mythology, so she knew about the god of the underworld, which is what Pluto was. Uh, but she was also, I suppose, um, fortunate in that she 
lived, or her family lived with her grandfather, who happened to be the librarian of the Bodleian Library in Oxford. That's the university library in Oxford. And um, she, apparently her grandfather read out from the Times one day, one breakfast time, Oh, Venetia, they've discovered a planet in America. Because that's how they all speak in Oxford. See, so that's what it's like. And, and uh, she said, oh, well, they should call it Pluto. Uh, as you can see, there you are, I told you. She, um, she, she gave it its name. And um, he, uh, well, you know, he was quite impressed with that because he liked the reasoning. Uh, and I suppose most 11-year-olds suggesting a name for a planet wouldn't have gone any further, but he, uh, her, Venetia's grandfather, happened to be friendly with this gentleman, uh, whose name was Herbert Hall Turner, whose moustache I envy greatly. I wish I had one like that, except it's when you eat soup that you really run into problems with a moustache like that. Herbert Hall Turner was the was the professor of astronomy at the University of Oxford at the time. And on that same day, Venetia's grandfather called in on Turner, knocked on his door and said, by the way, my granddaughter thinks they should call this new planet Pluto. And uh, Turner said, oh, spiffing, that's a great idea, because they all talk like that, there, you know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, the agreement was that uh, the name of this new planet uh, could be Pluto, and Turner actually telegraphed to the Flagstaff, the Lowell Observatory, I beg your pardon, at Flagstaff uh, in Arizona to say, uh, we have a young lady here, you know, all that stuff, who thinks that it should be called Pluto. And they liked it. So I think it was the 30th of May, I'm not quite sure of the date, when it was actually formally named Pluto. And, well, Venetia was uh, clearly delighted. In later life, she became... Venetia Fair, Mrs. Venetia Fair, she married a teacher by the name of Mr. Fair and I once met one of his pupils who told me they used to call him Foxy Fair, uh, which is quite a nice bit of trivia. Um, and she sadly died in, uh, in April uh, 2009. She's no longer with us, but she was a pretty good age when she died. Uh, I, I think she's one of the delightful stories of, uh, of astronomy and somebody who wore, wore her... Uh, her I, su I suppose the honour of, ha of having been the only woman to name a planet, she wore it very lightly indeed. However, she was always at pains to point out that uh, the, the, the cartoon dog was named after her planet rather than the other way around, because Pluto the dog also emerged in uh, 1930. So that was all fine and dandy and everybody thought there was something much bigger than the Earth out there in the depths of the solar system that was doing all this stuff. But as time went on, astronomers gradually realized that Pluto was not what they thought it had been. It was not all it was uh, cooked up to be. Uh, and in fact, uh, almost immediately, people recognized that there was something weird about Pluto's orbit. It's very elongated compared with the other planets, which have got orbits that are almost circular. But also as time went on, and this is particularly after the Second World War, as astronomers refined their techniques, they, uh, their measurements, successive measurements of Pluto's diameter got smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and actually, um, by 1980, I think it was, two scientists in America wrote a paper that said that if Pluto's apparent size keeps on diminishing at its current rate, by 1986 it will have disappeared. Uh, so, you know, that got published. Uh, it was, of course, uh, tongue-in-cheek, but it was a, a, a very good point. Um, so Pluto, we now know, is smaller than the moon. It's a, a very small world. But uh, it was still considered to be a planet. And uh, it was really in the 1990s that the, the plot thickened because that, I think it was 1992 or thereabouts, um, um, Nick, Nick might know the exact date, uh, when QB1 was discovered. I think it was 92. This was, sorry? Smiley. That's right, yes. <laughs> this, uh, the first object... In a, in a category of, of icy asteroids that had been predicted 40 years earlier by a man called Gerard Kuiper and another one called Kenneth Edgeworth, uh, it was discovered. So, uh, so there was a new object, a new type of object discovered way out in the depths of the solar system beyond the orbit of, of Neptune. And we now call them the Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, this is a rather fanciful depiction, but you get the idea. There's an asteroid belt out there with objects which are probably partly rock at their cores but have a huge um, sort of coating of ice on them because they've never been warmed by the heat of the sun. And so the Kuiper Belt seemed to be 
actually where Pluto belonged, but nobody dared say it. Um, back in 1990, a man called Neil deGrasse Tyson, who, uh, is he, it's the Adler Planetarium, isn't it, that he's at? Uh, the Hayden, Planet, Hayden Planetarium, that's right, in, in um, America. He put together an exhibition which left out the planet Pluto. Uh, it took people a year to notice that Pluto wasn't there because he, d he basically reclassified it as an asteroid. And then he started getting hate mail from school children. Um, and so that was a kind of portent of things to come because astronomers were starting to realize with some embarrassment that Pluto was probably not a regular planet at all, that it was something else. But nobody w was brave enough to own up that it might need to change. Then... In uh, 2005, I think it was, uh, the cat was really set among the pigeons when an object in the Kuiper belt was discovered that's actually bigger than Pluto. Uh, we now know it's about the same diameter, but about 27% more massive. So a bigger object. It was called Xena at the time. It's now called Eris. Xena, the warrior princess. That was a great uh, working title uh, by, uh, by its discoverer, uh, Michael Brown and his team. So embarrassment was growing about the whole deal of what exactly is a planet. And the governing body of astronomy, the International Astronomical Union, which dots all the I's and crosses all the T's and which every three years has a general assembly and where Nick was in Prague in uh, 2006, they decided it was time they did something about it. So like any organization that's embarrassed about something, they formed a committee. It's what you do. Uh, you know, if you can't think of what to do next, you form a committee. So uh, they did, and this was their planet definition committee. A very, um, I suppose, erudite and accomplished group of people. There's astronomers, there's space scientists, planetary scientists, and in the front row here, a, a very famous author. That is Deva Sobel, whose name you might well know because she wrote a well-known book called Longitude uh, a, 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 over a decade ago and followed it up with one about Galileo's daughter. Many, many of you might have read that and a book about the planets. So she was, as a, as a journalist and somebody with a, a background in how we use words, she was felt, felt to be a very worthwhile addition to the committee, as indeed she was. However, um, reading between the lines, I think she, uh, she kind of wished that she had never got mixed up with all this stuff because it turned out to be uh, really such a quagmire of complete, competing definitions. Anyway, what they were charged with doing was reporting back to the International Astronomical Union's General Assembly in Prague in August 2006 and they uh, made it their business. They only actually had about two weeks to do this but they uh, were, were charged with coming up with a definition of a planet, which they did. Uh, and their definition said that a planet in the solar system, anyway, is something that orbits the sun, so that rules out all the various moons of planets because they orbit the planets themselves. Uh, it orbits the sun and it is big enough that its own gravity has overcome the resistance of the rocks or whatever else it's made of and pulled it into a spherical shape. So a planet is orbiting the sun and it's spherical. By that definition, though, the solar system would have something like uh, 13 planets. And that just proved too hard for the IAU to swallow. So on the 26th of August uh, at this meeting, you'll remember this, Nick, uh, the General Assembly held its discussion on what constitutes a planet. It was, I suppose, guided through that whole meeting by its then president, whose picture you can see up there on the right, uh, his name is Ron Eckert. He's a very, very eminent Australian astronomer and he was president of the IAU at the time for the three-year stint. I, I can't say I envy him the task of actually guiding the IAU through something that should have been defined 400 years earlier. But um, he did it rather well. Uh, the point was, though, that the General Assembly didn't like the Planet Definition Committee's uh, uh, definition and uh, it was Jocelyn Bell Burnell wasn't it who chaired all the debate about how can you modify that uh, definition to be something that's more acceptable and they did they added another uh, criterion for planethood and that is that to be a planet you've got to have cleared your neck of the woods in the solar system in other words your gravity has to have either tossed things out of the solar system as occasionally happens or has happened in the past or suck things in like the, the, like the meteors 
that we see here on Earth. They're bits of debris which are coming in, especially when they uh, land over uh, Chelyabinsk, uh, with the, all the, um, the Russian dashboard cameras uh, there to record the event, uh, like we saw a month ago. Stunning stuff. Um, so the Earth is sweeping up debris still, but most of the big debris has gone. So the definition included that extra criterion, and there they are taking the vote. Uh, here's the secretary, then secretary of the IAU, uh, Ian Corbett, at the front with his hand well up. Where are you, Nick? I'm sure you must be on that. You're off the picture. Oh, that's very inconsiderate of you. I'd love to have been able to show you yourself in uh, Prague. So there it was, and it was almost a unanimous vote, wasn't it? It was a very, very... Shall we ask him which way he voted? <laughs> no, we won't embarrass you. But it was almost unanimous that the definition should include the idea that a planet has cleared its vicinity of debris. And what that meant then was that in the inventory of the solar system, uh, the rocky objects uh, that we've always called planets, Mercury, Venus, the Earth and Mars, are planets. But the biggest asteroid, Ceres, which is spherical, isn't because it hasn't cleared the rest of the main asteroid belt. And neither are the things out there in the Kuiper belt. Uh, there, are, there were, at that time, uh, uh, four objects which were known to be spherical, which were way out there in the, in the Kuiper belt, which hadn't cleared it. So they didn't count as planets either, and so a new definition was cooked up of a dwarf planet. And a dwarf planet is something that's spherical but hasn't cleared its neighbourhood of debris. And so that includes Ceres in the main asteroid belt, and a big pun, there's Ceres. And in the, uh, in the Kuiper belt, Haumea, Makimaki, Pluto and Eris. Um, four worlds which are spherical but are not planets. So that was the way the definition went. And these are just put there with our moon to show you the size. They are very small worlds. And so that meant that Pluto uh, became a dwarf planet. And that's how things stand today. Um, now, if the IAU thought that uh, that was going to pass unnoticed by the world's population, uh, they were sadly mistaken uh, because there was an uproar uh, absolutely. Uh, many of you will remember it. On the 27th of August, <laughs> 2006, what? Pluto's not a planet. The headline I loved was in a magazine that was published in uh, Newcastle here in New South Wales. It said, Pluto dumped by the uber nerds of Prague. Not just the nerds, it's the uber nerds, like Nick. Uh, <laughs> did you vote for... I knew you would, yeah. I knew you would have done. So the, 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 uh, yeah, the, the headlines went all around the world. Uh, in America, they had protests. Uh, they marched uh, to protest against uh, the emotion of Pluto. Uh, and uh, there were cartoons everywhere. You probably can't read this, but the caption, there's Pluto, and the caption is, I can't believe I have to sit at the little planet's table. Uh, poor old Pluto's down at the bottom there, and all the other planets are at the big planet's table. And of course, you know, cartoons showing... Uh, showing uh, poor old Pluto being glared at by all the other planets. Uh, actually, perhaps the saddest event took place in Western Australia, not far from Perth, where they had a funeral. Uh, and uh, here's uh, a coffin, there's Pluto. Um, <laughs> of course, Pluto isn't dead, it's still there. It's just that we now know... Uh, that it's not a planet. And, uh, I mean, there, there is still actually some controversy about all this. Uh, perhaps the, the person you've got to feel most sorry for uh, is, is uh, the, the man who uh, was the... Well, he still is. He's the mission scientist for the New Horizons spacecraft, uh, which was launched to, to Pluto in January 2006, but by August 2006, it wasn't going to a planet anymore. It was going to a dwarf planet. His name's Alan Stern, and he doesn't like the definition. But I think most other astronomers do. And what it shows is science in action. When, when there is new information, science responds by changing its ideas. So when Pluto was discovered, we thought it was a planet. Now we realize it's not like the other planets. We've changed that. So we have a solar system with eight planets, of which Pluto is not one of them. Pluto is a dwarf planet. Except in Illinois. Uh, because in Illinois, they were so upset by the idea that they legislated to keep Pluto as a planet. So, if you don't like the science, you can legislate.
<laughs> I'd like to finish off with um, one other. Uh, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're, we're not too bad. Uh, I'm not going to go on for too much longer, but let me take you somewhere else uh, on the Star Craving tour, because one of the chapters of Star Craving Mad is called Dark Secrets, and it's about um, perhaps the two biggest mysteries that confront astronomers at the moment, one of which I don't have time to talk about, which is just as well, because that's the bigger of the two. But uh, dark matter is something whose name uh, I'm sure you've heard, uh, and uh, it has a, it's a story with uh, an Australian flavour, as indeed is the story of dark energy, which is the other embarrassing secret that we don't know about. Uh, but the, this story goes back to 1933, uh, when there was an astronomer, a Swiss-American astronomer, by the name of Fritz Vicky, who, as you can see, worked throughout uh, most of the middle of the 20th century. Uh, that's his picture there. He's, he was a real character. Um, one of these people who didn't suffer fools gladly, and he's well known among astronomers as uh, being the person who described his colleagues as spherical bastards. Uh, why were they spherical? Because they were bastards whichever way you looked at them. And the only thing that's like that is a sphere. So he certainly had a way with words. But in 1933, he, uh, he noticed that um, he was measuring the speeds of g galaxies in a cluster of galaxies. Uh, galaxies are like other things that we find, sheep for example, they like to cluster together uh, in herds, we call them galaxy clusters, they're the biggest aggregations of matter in the universe, but he could measure the speeds of them and recognise that uh, if the only thing that was there was what he could see, the cluster should have evaporated because these galaxies were moving too fast for their own gravity to keep them bound together. Um, and that was actually the anomaly that led to the discovery of dark matter. That's a picture of the cluster of galaxies he was working on. It's, not, it's a modern picture. It's called the Coma Cluster. It's named after the constellation of Coma Berenices, a northern hemisphere uh, constellation. Uh, Berenices Hare, it's a lovely name. Uh, so he realized that uh, it would need more stuff than he could see to keep the galaxies bound into the cluster. Otherwise, it should have evaporated billions of years ago. We should not see a cluster there. We should just see galaxies sort of spread out throughout the sky. Uh, and, well, he was very surprised. As you can see, he was occasionally said German words. Um, so he uh, realized that what this meant was that there was an invisible component present in the cluster, something there that had uh, a gravitational aspect to it. In other words, it had gravity so it could hold the cluster together, but it was invisible. It wasn't possible to see it by being silhouetted against something brighter, nor did it emit any light. So this stuff was uh, a, a mysterious component. In fact, uh, it, he was largely ignored, I have to say, uh, which is perhaps why I call everybody spherical bastards. And the reason why he was ignored was because nobody could understand it. It was one of these things that was just too big a puzzle. And then in 1970, an Australian astronomer who's still going strong, I'm delighted to say, he, he's uh, one of my colleagues on the, the RAVE project, his name is Ken Freeman. He uh, noticed that when he looked at the way galaxies themselves rotate, and I'll show you a picture of a galaxy, in fact I'll show you that now, that's a uh, rather beautiful galaxy uh, with the... Um, rather inelegant name of NGC 1300. Uh, we're not very good at naming things, but that's a, it's a flattened disk of material with these beautiful spiral arms. And in fact, this one has something called a bar across the middle, uh, which our galaxy also has, but not as well pronounced as that. Anyway, Ken Freeman noticed that when he looked at the way these things are rotating, they are rotating too fast for gravity to hold them together. So they should fly apart. And once again, that was a puzzle that uh, he sort of floated to the community and was greeted with mixed reactions. Some people thought, oh, well, there's probably something wrong somewhere, but there won't be a problem. But other people recognized that there was a problem. And then an, an American astronomer called Vera Rubin uh, came along and did the same sorts of measurements. And that is when the whole idea of dark matter, whatever it is, uh, became an issue for the world's astronomers. So modern measurements of uh, not just single galaxies like this, but also galaxies spread across the, the universe from surveys like the one I showed you made at the UK Schmidt Telescope, they show that uh, whatever dark matter is, it, it, outweighs, it outweighs visible matter by about 5 to 1. 
Um, and we also know that it, it likes to be where normal matter is. It likes to be where the, the visible matter, for example, in galaxies, most normal matter is hydrogen. Um, the, other, the other stuff, the stuff of which we are made and this room's made, are just the kind of pollutants at a very low level. Most of the universe is made of hydrogen. Uh, but the hydrogen is outweighed five to one by dark matter, whatever it is. Uh, the other thing that uh, astronomers have recognized over the last 15 years or so is that dark matter likes to be where normal matter is. So wherever you find galaxies or clusters of galaxies, there are blobs of dark matter. There are various ways of detecting it, but not because it emits light. It's all about gravity. So <clears throat> the question is, what is it? And the two theories during the 1980s were actually the only clever names I think astronomers have ever given to anything, uh, machos and wimps. Uh, Machos, um, which we now don't believe are a major component of dark matter, it stands for massive compact halo objects. And what it means is objects in the halos, uh, the outer regions of galaxies, which are compact and massive. Gosh, where do they think of these things? So it's like, um, for example, if you've got stars that have died and don't emit any light, um, um, which are called black dwarfs, if you've got black holes, which likewise don't emit radiation, at least not at, at, uh, at, these way, at uh, most wavelengths, um, it's the stuff swirling into them that emits the radiation, or orphan planets, that was another candidate, or just dead stars, stars that, that have never got bright enough to really burst into life, or ne never got big enough to burst into life. So they were one possible candidate for dark matter. But that was ruled out by experiments actually carried out, among other places, at the Mount Stromlo Observatory in Canberra during the 1990s. It was essentially ruled out as the major component of dark matter. WIMPs, however, is on the ascendancy. WIMPs are weakly interacting massive particles. What else? What else would it be? Um, and what it means is they're subatomic particles of an unknown species, something that we don't know yet uh, its identity. It might even be many different kinds of species, as I'll perhaps try and explain in a minute. But um, WIMPs are massive, so these particles have mass. They're quite big as subatomic particles go. They are weakly interacting, which means that they don't interact in any way with normal matter. So, for example, they could be, and indeed we believe they are, whizzing through you and me at the moment. You might feel a twinge occasionally, but for the most part, you don't feel anything. This is stuff that is just permeating the whole of our region of space. Um, as I said, that is now the favoured interpretation since the, the, the machos were knocked on the head. So what's the best bet we have for identifying what this stuff is? Well, my belief is that the best bet comes from something to do with particle physics. And there are a number of experiments going on, including some in space actually, that might help us identify what the WIMPs are but the, probably the, the most spectacular one uh, is this one. And this is uh, an aerial photograph taken near Geneva uh, in Switzerland. Actually, uh, this in the foreground is France. The border is there between Switzerland and France. There's Lac Le Mans, which is the, the lake that borders uh, Geneva. These are a few Alps in the background. I think the, there's a probably Mont Blanc there, but I'm not sure, I should check that. But the thing in the foreground where the ring has been drawn, of course, is the Large Hadron Collider, which has been in the news uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's been running since the end of 2009, and very spectacularly so too. So what is it? Well, it's a tunnel underneath the landscape, about 100 meters deep. Uh, it's more or less horizontal. It's actually tilted very slightly, but it's more or less horizontal. And it's 27 kilometers long. And in that tunnel, uh, deep beneath the Earth, are two tubes which are carrying subatomic particles going in opposite directions at 99.9999999% of the speed of light. There are four nines. Um, they're going very fast, in other words. And at four points uh, around the circumference of this ring, uh, there are places where these beams can be made to cross. Uh, one there, one there one there and one here. Uh, and at those points, the beams, since they're going in opposite directions, the particles collide. And that's where enormous experiments are set up in order to measure what happens when particles collide together. 
Uh, the engineering is, is staggering. This is a, a kind of cutaway of the tube, the, the tube itself in its tunnel, uh, 100 metres below the ground. These are the tube, the two little tubes at the heart of everything that's carrying the, uh, the, the beams of subatomic particles. It's usually protons, but it's also, they also collide uh, lead ions, which are lead atoms with no electrons around them. Uh, that's uh, an above-ground mock-up of the same thing. This thing's about, I suppose, about um, uh, almost a metre in diameter, 80 centimetres, 90 centimetres, something like that. But when you open up the little cover panels on it and look inside, the engineering is absolutely staggering. That stuff goes on for 27 kilometres. Uh, there are skeins of microscopic copper tubing carrying supercooled liquid he helium, which are sort of woven together almost like fabric. Uh, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure in the vacuum tubes is lower than the pressure at the surface of the moon. Uh, and the temperature in, those vacu uh, in the uh, uh, superconducting magnets that actually guide the beams around the circle, uh, the temperature there is lower than the temperature of space. It's a very uh, amazing machine with all kinds of superlatives. I threw this diagram in because um, I just wanted to show you the kind of gobbledygook that um, uh, subatomic physicists talk about. If you think we astronomers talk in strange words, wait till you see what they do. Um, so these are, this is the, the, the known suite of fundamental particles. In other words, these are thought to be the most rudimentary building blocks of matter. And there are 16 of them. Um, the, the quarks, the leptons, and the force, uh, the, the force um, particles, of which the easiest to understand is that one, uh, which is a photon, a particle of light. We can all kind of understand that. Even Newton got that. Um, this uh, diagram, of course, shows the 17th, which has now been confirmed, actually is no longer described as a Higgs-like particle. It is called the Higgs boson. This is a, a particle predicted by uh, a physicist uh, by the name of Peter Higgs in Edinburgh back in the 1960s who said, I think there should be another particle that we haven't discovered that yet. Actually, he said, I think there should be another particle that we haven't discovered yet, because he's a Scotsman. And all Scots sound like a declaration of war. I used to live there, so I know. Um, but that uh, boson, which is thought to give the other particles the property of mass, has now been found. Back in, in July, it was dis defined. The statistics have been trawled through. And as of a meeting last week, people are saying, yes, it is the Higgs boson that has been discovered. So 17 subatomic particles, which reveal themselves by the way they behave when you cl collide these two beams of stuff together. It's basically just smashing things together to see what the smaller pieces are that come off. You know, it's if you imagine hitting two stones together, they break up, and they break up into smaller particles. So it's just a gigantic microscope. That's really all this machine is. Uh, however, a very uh, elegant and a very capable one. This uh, picture shows the model. It's in the foyer of the Atlas uh, experiment uh, control room. Uh, it shows a model of uh, one of the detectors, which is called Atlas. So the beams come in at one side and the other. And all this gubbins here is meant to measure what comes off when you collide the particles. And just to give you an idea of the scale, can you see those figures uh, that are drawn on the side there? So this is something like 50 meters uh, from the top to the bottom of its, uh, of its cavern underneath the, uh, the, the, the suburbs of Geneva. But what's the link with dark matter? Well, there is a theory which the, is dear to the heart of uh, particle physicists because it seems to answer some problems that, uh, that have been thrown up, uh, which is that every particle might have what's called a supersymmetric shadow particle. Uh, and that diagram kind of shows it in a rather rudimentary form. These sh it's called the supersymmetry theory, or SUSY, actually. It's normally known as SUSY. It's only a theory. It's not yet proven. But uh, if these particles exist, there's a handful of them that are really great candidates for dark matter. They fit the bill uh, for what dark matter might look like. And so uh, the push is on to try and identify supersymmetry. The LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, switched off at the moment. It's being upgraded to twice its energy, and it will fire up again in December next year, by which time we hope uh, we might start seeing evidence of supersymmetry, and all the dark matter people might stop worrying and go home, because it could solve the problem. Meanwhile, the engineering is so spectacular that uh, it's a great place to take... Uh, 
parties of tourists. Um, Marnie and I have done that. And also, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I accompanied a film crew who were making a segment for uh, 60 Minutes about this collider. And we had a great time there with various Kiwi and Australian engineers and scientists who were involved. This gentleman is the engineer who runs the whole thing. He's a, uh, from New Zealand. He um, was totally modest about uh, what he does, but it's astonishing. And they filmed uh, outside in the cafeteria at CERN. They filmed a bunch of Australian physicists talking about particle physics, you might recognize Bruce Yabsley there, who's well known to those of us who, um, who've uh, been associated with the University of Sydney. But, uh, and I'm going to finish here, I'm sorry I've gone over time, I hadn't realized I'd rambled on so much, so forgive me, uh, but there is a, uh, something that really, I suppose it, it, um, it cheered me up in a way, because as I was leaving this place, uh, I noticed uh, in the cafeteria, which is, has got 4,000 physicists all talking about physics, I noticed this, which is a little animal hutch. And on the side, it says the CERN Animal Shelter for Computer Mice. And, and it's got a web address. So I checked that up. And if you go to that website, you find that they take their mice very seriously indeed here. Uh, so they feed them. Uh, they give them things to drink so that they don't get too thirsty. Uh, they make sure they've got somewhere to sleep and somewhere to play. Uh, once in a while, of course, uh, things go just a little bit wrong uh, in the environment of the, uh, the animal hutch. Uh, the reason why it cheered me up is because, like so many uh, in the world of science, it told me that these people, at the, probably one of the, the premier scientific institutions in the whole world, they do not take themselves too seriously. And I think that's a mark of a great scientist and one of the hallmarks of science today as we grapple with this, which is the mysteries of the universe. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I'm sorry to have gone over time. But thank you.